Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Minna from Ashray Falcon Chapter, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. We're very delighted to have you with us today, and uh, we're very excited for our webinar on alternative refrigerants. We look forward to having a very informative and interesting session. Firstly, I'd like to take you through uh, our, the ASHRAE Code of Ethics. Uh, in this and all other ASHRAE meetings, we will act with honesty, fairness, courtesy, competence, inclusiveness, and respect for others, which, which exemplify our core values of excellence, commitment, integrity, collaboration, volunteerism, and diversity, and shall avoid all real or perceived conflicts of interest. Uh, I'll quickly take you through this disclaimer, which, is, which states that the information contained within is presented by Ashray Falcon Chapter as a supplier slash stakeholder webinar. It presents information of current interest and to provide a venue for interaction between Ashray Falcon Chapter members, the different industry stakeholders, and the webinar presenter. These webinars should not be considered peer-reviewed or the final word on any subject. ASHRAE Falcon Chapter has not investigated, and ASHRAE Falcon Chapter expressly disclaims any duty to investigate any product, service, procedure, design, or the like, which may be described herein. The appearance of any technical data or editorial material in this presentation does not constitute endorsement, warranty, or guarantee by ASHRAE Falcon Chapter of any product, service, process, procedure, design, or the like. I'd just like to quickly remind you that we're going to be recording this webinar and uploading it to the Ashray Falcon Chapter YouTube channel. Um, if you'd like to download the presentation that's going to be used by the speaker, you may do so through the handouts. And uh, we're going to be having a live Q&A session at the end of this webinar. So you, you're kindly requested to send us any technical inquiries you may have through the questions uh, panel. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to present to you our speaker for today, Dr. Omar Abdelaziz. Dr. Omar, I'll leave the floor to you to begin the presentation. All right. Thanks, Minna. Um, it gives me quite a pleasure to return to the Ashley Falcon chapter. I've been uh, working closely with them between 2017 and 2019, and here, back, here I am. Uh, in 2020, uh, sharing uh, a nice presentation on alternative refrigerants. Uh, I am um, um, Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Zwaid City of Science and Technology. I am also the co-chair for the, um, uh, the Montreal Protocol Refrigeration, Air Conditioning and Heat Pump Technical Option Committee and serve on, on TIEP. I also hold uh, several um, uh, seats within ASHRI. I am uh, the research liaison for Section 6 and I'm also um, voting members, uh, voting member for several technical committees. Uh, without further uh, discussions, uh, I'd like to first thank you all and uh, move to um, showing my presentation today. I hope you can all uh, see the, the slides. All right, so today we will talk about alternative refrigerants for high ambient temperature environments. And um, basically, uh, this is uh, uh, an introductory slide about Zouin City of Science and Technology. It is uh, um, uh, deployed by Dr. Ahmed Zouin, may peace be upon him. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Ahmed Zouin, um, wanted to create this uh, framework for research, academia, and incubation, and that from which came Zouin City. Um, so the agenda is we will uh, look at some background information about why we need to change alternatives and refrigerants, what are the different alternatives for different applications, um, what are the related standards and codes, and then system uh, perspective. So um, the the history of the refrigerant um, in the 1830s to 1930s, they didn't worry about the chemical itself as long as the chemical can provide refrigeration. And the early version of refrigerants included uh, natural refrigerants um, largely like ammonia, carbon dioxide, hydrocarbons, 
um, even motor vapor and sulfuric oxide, even uh, methyl, methyl chloride. Then in the 1930s, uh, people start to uh, worry about the safety and the stability of the refrigerant. And from this came the CFCs and the HCFC. And for a long period uh, where uh, CFCs were regarded as the silver bullet for air conditioning and refrigeration, and they were used um, extensively throughout all the applications. R11 was used for um, chillers, and R12 was, was used for almost anything else. Of course, ammonia still was used uh, for uh, large and industrial refrigeration applications. And then there came the third wave of um, refrigerant. In this wave, people started to learn that the ozone layer is uh, being compromised due to the, um, the, the reactions happening in the troposphere between atoms in the CFCs and the ozone. So a, new, a second generation of innovation in, in refrigerant came, uh, came to realization, and people started to focus on using uh, refrigerants with much lower ozone depletion potential. They, they put, put um, R12 as a, an ozone depletion potential of one, and anything can be related to it. And R22 was found to have ozone depletion potential of only 0.05, roughly. Uh, also, R123 uh, remained um, uh, for use in, in, uh, in chillers. And then new breed of refrigerant called hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, came uh, to realization, like R134A, R410A, R404A, as well as other brands. And then in, the, uh, in 2010 and after, uh, people started to worry about the global warming. And uh, people to start to think like, uh, maybe those HFCs that we touted as environmentally safe are not environmentally safe anymore, because uh, um, a refrigerant like R404A would have uh, the global warming potential of roughly 4,000 times that of CO2. So what happened? People started to look into new breed of refrigerants that are either lower GWP, like R32, or like extremely low GWP, like, like hydrofluorocarbons, um, and also blends of these uh, different molecules. But also, there was a renewed interest in natural refrigerants, including carbon dioxide and hydrocarbon. So what motivated the refrigerant transition? <clears throat> the first motivation came during the Vienna Convention, uh, which focused on the protection of the ozone layer. Uh, there was 21 articles covering scientific research needs that needs to be done, monitoring the ozone depletion phenomena, exchange of information and technology, as well as uh, and two years later came the Montreal Protocol, one of the most successful proto uh, multilateral protocols ever. And the uh, Montreal Protocol uh, was developed in 1987, uh, 21 articles covering definitions, control measures, data reporting, monitor of trade, legislative requirements, non-compliance consequences. But what was very important and crucial for the success of the Montreal Protocol was financial assistance and technology transfer to developing countries. And the multilateral, uh, uh, multilateral fund uh, was created where donor uh, countries, like eight countries, the USA, Europe, uh, uh, Australia, Japan, and the like, uh, would give or donate money so that new conversion projects can happen in Article 5 countries or the developing countries. The protocol happened through the years um, from 1990, 92, 97, 99, and then the Montreal adjustment in 2007 to include. But uh, the voice, mm -hmm. your voice is a little unclear to the speak to the listeners. So I'm very sorry to interrupt. But do you mind uh, switching off the webcam? It might make the voice kind of clear. Because okay, so I just switch off. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Minna. I just switched off the camera. I, I hope uh, my voice is uh, clear now. Um, so I was just saying that the Montreal Protocol is one of the most successful protocols uh, ever, and uh, was used to um, 
to develop a transition plan away from chlorofluorocarbon or ozone depleting substances. Uh, it was signed in 1987, 21. It had 21 articles. One of the most uh, relevant thing is the financial assistance, assistance and technology transfer between developed and developing countries. Uh, and that helped developing countries achieve their transition or phase out targets, as well as um, working on uh, the phase down now for the Kigali. So the Kigali impact, um, basically um, we have phase down, not a phase out. So we want to re reduce the use, the, reduce the, um, the global warming potential associated with refrigerants used in air conditioning, refrigeration, heat pumping, uh, uh, things like methyl, methyl bromide used for um, agriculture, as well as fisheries and so on and so forth. Um, Kigali, with Kigali we can avoid over 80 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide, which is equivalent, uh, which is which can have an impact on the global warming potential. So you can see here on this figure, and let me use um, the laser pointer here. So basically, the business as usual would result in a temperature increase between uh, 0.3 and almost 0.5. And if we go with the Kigali Amendment in 2016, the amount of re reduced carbon dioxide equivalent emitted, which is, which is 80 billion, will get us to only 0.06, which means that we have about 0.44 degrees C save, uh, saved, or 0.5 roughly, uh, 0.5 degrees Celsius of global temperature rise by 2100. And also we will continue to protect the ozone layer. So Kigali hydrofluorocarbon phase down schedule, we have uh, the European F gas, we have A2 countries, so A2 is basically the developed countries, we have A5, A5 countries group one, and then Article 5 countries group two. And you can see here for um, the, uh, like countries that are in, in group two, uh, like Bahrain, India, uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, Kuwait, Oman, Pakistan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, um, you need to start reducing the energy, the global warming potential refrigerants in 2032, and then eventually achieve 15% reduction by 2047. Um, so the the high ambient temperature countries get a little bit of a special treat because now they can transition later on. However, there um, there is a steep drop between. 20, uh, uh, 46 and 2047. You move from 70% of your baseline to 15% of the baseline. Um, also for A2, like the developed countries, there is an exception for Belarus, Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, um, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. And also um, there is uh, the group two uh, exception for A5, as, as I mentioned. Um, under the current Kigali uh, protocol amendments, th there will be a technology review four or five years before 2028. So basically, in uh, two to three years, we will start to do technology review and see if this schedule can be uh, achieved or we need to uh, delay this schedule. The good thing is well, there is a technology pull. Article 2 countries have already stopped the production of hydrofluorocarbons and are limiting their use. Uh, the hydrofluorocarbon market is becoming, becoming very mature, but also the alternative refrigerants are already being extensively uh, used. And in the development, um, these developments in developing countries will be available uh, via international pull through. So, for example, there are uh, international corporations like Carrier or Train or uh, uh, York that have operations in uh, Article 5, five countries. When, when these country, when these international corporation, uh, corporation develop solution for the A2 countries, they would want to see them translated to Article 5 countries and then they would have this potential for any problem. There will be also additional uh, regulations and rules in developed uh, in development for Article 2 countries that can be used 
as model for Article 5 countries, and most recently, the United Nations, uh, United Nations Environmental Program had this model regulation for the room air conditioner and uh, the refrigerator. Now, uh, the Kigali ratification, until December 31st, uh, 2019, there was 67 countries have ratified with six, within with 16 in Africa, and 92 ratified or accepted the amendment. So basically, 92 have ratified the amendment, and only about um, 25 have also have accepted. And this kind of this map is dynamic. There are more people coming along um, um, quickly. Unfortunately, as you can see here, most of the Arab world, most of the, uh, of the region at large, have not uh, ratified uh, the amendment. So in, uh, in, in the Montreal Protocol, there is a phase out, which means that we want to completely eliminate the hydrofluorocarbons, but there is a phase down for the hydrofluorocarbons, and there are overlapped commitments. So you can see here, between now uh, or 10 years ago and 2030, HPMPs, which, is, which stands for Hydrochlorofluorocarbon uh, Project Management Plans, or phase out. Uh, we want by 2030 to completely eliminate the use of um, hydrofluorocarbons. Now, there are there are hydrofluorocarbon plants or HPPMP, um, and the, sorry, not HPPMP, uh, hydrofluorocarbon plants KP, KPMP, um, and there is an overlap commitment between 2024 and 2030. This overlap overlap commitment can allow us to do some leapfrogging, and instead of moving from HCFC to HFC and then eventually to lower GWP refrigerants, we can move from HCFC to lower GWP refrigerants directly. So uh, the global warming um, was widely acknowledged and publicized in 1990s and 2000. And in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Kyoto Protocol on Global Climate Change was uh, discussed between 1997 uh, to 2012 and now in, uh, until 2020. Uh, the primary greenhouse gases are the water vapor, uh, which exhibit uh, radio forcing. The next most uh, potent greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide and methane, uh, that's in terms of the quantity available in the atmosphere. But also gases with high CO2 comparison value, like the hydrofluorofluorocarbon. So, for example, R22 would have. Uh, GWP or global warming potential of roughly 1800 and hydrofluorocarbons, as I said, um, R404A is 4000 times that of CO2 and um, R14A, which is another um, famous and widely used refrigerant, has about uh, 2000 times the global warming potential of CO2. And you can see here, uh, this is an interesting um, chart showing the total annual greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see CO2 from fossil fuel. And so this is only the anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, the water vapor emissions are very minimal in terms of uh, from, a, from a, an anthropogenic point of view. But um, um, you can see here in this chart, until 2020, 2010, it was 65% coming from CO2 from fossil fuel uh, for, and, and industrial uh, processes. And then we had um, uh, uh, about 11% um, FOLU. And then CH4, which is methane, 16%. This comes out from um, uh, cattle production from other industrial processes and so on. And then there is uh, 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 nitros and then F gas. You can see the F gas or like hydrofluorocarbon and, and hydrofluorocarbon, this very dark uh, sliver. And you can see that as we move, in uh, the, the the dark sliver keeps increasing and widening. And FOLU stands for forestry and other land use. So basically, when you um, when you try to clear out a forest or when you try to do some something like that, the, the amount of CO2 production associated with it can be digressed. For uh, common refrigerants like um, um, R134A and so on, we can see here the global warming potential. 
And I'm using here a log scale. Why, why am I using a log scale? Because things can, can vary dramatically. Actually, R12 is off the chart. R12, the global warming potential for R12 is in the order of 12,000. 12, the R11 is in the order of maybe six to six to 7,000. And then you have here R22 uh, in the range of um, uh, 2,000 or 1,800. R123 is less than uh, 100. So this is CFC. This is HCFC. And then now these are HFCs. And you can see that the HFCs are all above uh, 1,000. And then we have the R32 below 1,000. It's about 675. And then we have the new refreshments. They do not appear on the chart because the, the GWP is in the order of one. Uh, so basically, they do not appear on the chart. And then we have here the natural refrigerants. Most of them, again, do not appear on the chart. So carbon dioxide has a, has a GWP of one, ammonia has a GWP of zero, and the others vary between two and four. So what is the required properties for refrigerant gas? Uh, it has to, to be with a boiling point between minus 40 and 32 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 40. Uh, to, to zero degrees C. It has to be non-flammable. However, it's a tall order to get a non-flammable refrigerant with, with all uh, the desired properties that we want. It has to be non-toxic or less toxic at least. Uh, we need to make sure that we have chemical st stability inside the refrigeration machine. However, um, it's okay if, if it's not stable in the atmosphere. It would be good if has a pungent odor uh, for leak detection. Unfortunately, things like um, uh, some of the new refreshers do not have a pungent odor. So when they leak, people do not notice that they leak. Um, also, it's, it would be good if they are not expensive and should not contain chlorine, bromine, or iodine uh, in order to make sure that they do not deplete the ozone and must have short atmospheric lifetime to minimize the global warming potential. So to, to do so, the refrigerant chemical suppliers worked on uh, doing things to the refrigeration refrigerant molecules. And first thing they thought of is how can they develop or design a molecule that would react with common atmospheric species to shorten the lifespan. And the chemical approach first increase the number of hydrogen atoms. But when you do that, the, the molecule becomes more flammable. Also include oxygen uh, or other uh, components that would react with uh, atmospheric oxygen. Reduce the chemical stability. Uh, so you want to add bromine or iodine. But we said earlier that we don't want to do that because adding bromine or iodine add ozone depletion to the molecule. Uh, and last but not but not least is um, unsaturation, which means that we want to use double or triple bonds uh, within the molecule. Like using hydro, uh, like using olefins. So the best approach was between these is uh, to do the unsaturation and hydrogen. So hydrofluoroolefin, hydrofluorofluoroolefin, hydrochloroolefin, and hydrobromofluoroolefins uh, came uh, um, to effect, and people start to use them. The major issue was the flammability increased. So these are some of the, um, the refrigerant refrigerants molecules that were developed. And you can see here, the first one was the R1234YF. It's an A2L refrigerant. It has a double bond here and uh, the hydrogen atoms on one um, carbon atom. And then um, um, an isomer of this, uh, another isomer of this uh, molecule is the R1234ZEE. Also an A2L refrigerant, and you can see here that the difference between this and this molecule is that here we have one hydrogen atom on each of those um, on the, of the double bond carbon molecules. And then other molecules came uh, to effect. Here we have a fluorine atom, we have a fluorine atom here, and um, sorry, a fluorine atom, not a fluorine atom. This is a uh, Yeah, a chlorine. This is a chlorine atom. So the, the 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 small ones are the chlorine, 
and these are the chlorine atoms. And then you can see this one. Um, it's very simpler, simple molecule, one of the simplest molecules in, in them. The issue here is, um, as you can see, there are double bonds. The molecular structure is complicated, so producing these molecules is not as easy as producing R1234A R1 R1 or some of the earlier refreshments, which means that they are going to be more expensive. So what do we do to, to select a refrigerant? Uh, basically, we have to consider the environmental performance. We want the ozone depletion potential to be as close to zero or as close to zero as possible. And we want to reduce the global warming potential. We want to consider safety for consumers, so low flammability and low toxicity. We want to have energy efficiency, so reduce um, in the indirect CO2 emissions, especially at high ambient operation. We want to make sure that the IP will not cause issues and people would be able to still um, use uh, those refrigerants and uh, uh, the cycles associated with them. The transition cost to industry and finally the product sustainability. So if, for example, a molecule is being uh, or a refrigerant is being offered, is this refrigerant uh, good for the next 10, 15 years or do we think that uh, in few years, people will not be able to use this refresh. And then we have this uh, very interesting um, checkpoints. So we know to check whether it's flammable or not, toxic, toxic or not. Uh, is it within acceptable operating pressure? Is it, is it stable refreshment? Uh, what is the impact on the compressor and cycle design? Zero ODP, low GWP, compatible with our uh, equipment does not have a large glides and so on and so forth. So um, as, as of um, like now, the ASHI standard 34 has started to, to has about nine distinct molecules, 43 refrigerant blends. And um, the first low WP molecule introduced into ASHI standard 34 was in 2008, FFO1234YF. And then the first blend was um, in 2012, also class 2L. And then the first non-flammable blend was in 2013. And by 2017, mid of 2017, there are nine distinct molecules and 43 refrigerant blends. So um, according to the Refrigeration, Air Conditioning and Heat Pump Technical Option Committee a report that was published in 2018, if we want to look at a safe or a uh, category A1 refrigerant low GWP proposed between 2010 and 2018, you can see here that for R134A alternatives, there are there are some here uh, with GWP between uh, like 300 and a little above 500. So we have a lot of refrigerants that can be uh, acceptable as um, R134A alternatives and within uh, lower GWP. For R22, like refrigerants, we had uh, very, like for A1 refrigerants or, or C, not inflammable refrigerants, all of the alternatives are above 1000 GWP, so it's not too attractive. Similar, similarly, for R404A, there are very few alternatives that are A1, and most of them are around the 2000 GWP. For the R14A, unfortunately, no A1 alternatives uh, were available between 2010 and 2018. However, in, um, in 2019, a new refrigerant blend for R14A, an refrigerant blend for R14A was um, proposed. The name is R466A, and it has a GWP of about 750, so it will stand here. Now, if we consider lower uh, flammability or mildly flammable uh, alternatives, so they are A to L, now we can see that for R134A, alternatives at, are uh, have low, much, much lower GWP. The GWP is um, between zero and maybe 200. For R22-like alternatives, we have uh, alternatives between um, 100 and 300. For R404A uh, alternatives, we have between 
150 and maybe 600. And then for R4 and E like alternatives, we have a lot of alternatives, but all of them between 400 and 700 um, GWP. So there is no silver silver bullet for the R4 and E like alternatives. For the R22 like alternatives, there are some. And for R134 E like alternatives, there are significant others. Significant um, alternatives. So according to the AHRI uh, Alternative Refrigerant Evaluation Program, uh, the, the R22 or R407C alternatives are, uh, are these. And um, the GWP for 100 years, um, according to the assessment report number five for the intergovernmental inter panel, um, is, uh, is, is displayed here, along with the uh, designation whether it's A1 or A2L and the ODP. So you can see here for R22, the GWP is 1760, and the ODP is 0 0.06. It is A1 refreshing. The alternatives, you can see here, like a 900 or above GWP, zero ODP. And then for A2L alternatives, you can have 146, 251, 195 with zero ODP. When we did uh, a simple cycle analysis, we found that most of these alternatives would uh, would have um, lower COP than uh, R22. It's like, like the, 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 the drop in COP is not significant, it's between zero and minus 8%. Um, of course, ammonia is better than R22, but ammonia is toxic and, and mildly flammable. Um, there are some alternatives that have a little bit of a uh, little bit higher um, capacity, uh, but most of them would be lower capacity and slightly lower GW, uh, lower COP. Sorry. For R404A uh, alternatives. Uh, we can see that there are plenty A1 alternatives. Most of them are above 1,000. And then um, this is uh, the remainder of the table. Uh, all of the A2L alternatives, again, around starting from 139 to 677. And we have one also around 1,000. And then we have an A3 alternative, which is propane. And this is the theoretical analysis. You can see that most um, refrigerants, or actually all refrigerants, would have better COP than R404A. Most of the alternatives would actually have better capacity than R404A. So R4, apparently R404A was not a, a, a good um, refrigerant to start with, and that's why there are plenty of refrigerants that would have better performance. For R134A, like alternatives, um, you can see here there are plenty that are A1, a few that are A2L, and a few that are A3. And uh, uh, impact on efficiency. Um, so the COP, you can see some would have no impact on, on COP. So the COP would remain unchanged, uh, like R1234ZE, AC5, AC5X. Uh, um, so these are all alternative versions proposed also by the chemical suppliers. And you can see here, some would have a little lower COP and some would have uh, lower COP but higher capacity. And finally, for r 14 a alternatives, um, the ARAP uh, alternatives uh, stop here. And these are the new alternatives in the last few years that are A1 or expected to be A1. So the theoretical analysis show that all of the r 4 a alternatives also have good performance. Um, the COP would be higher than the COP of the r 4 a and the capacity can be higher or slightly lower here within 5%. Uh, some alternatives would be even lower than 50%. So what does this um, give us is that it gives us a, a, an overall uh, feel that alternative refrigerants uh, are available plenty and are mostly more energy efficient and can be soft optimized to be to match the capacity as well.
So if we look at uh, compressor technology uh, and try to find what would be the best alternatives. So for centrifugal, uh, which is the low and medium pressure refrigerant, we want to find alternatives are um, R1223 like or R134A like refrigerants. Uh, for for screw compressors, these are medium and some high pressure. So we would like to find um, R134A like alternatives that would fit nicely with screw compressors. And for scroll and reciprocating compressors, uh, these are usually high pressure, mostly R22, R14A, and R407C. And you can see here in this figure where the different compressor technology would fit in terms of cooling capacity. So if we are on talking about smaller getting compressor between two to uh, uh, maybe 100 ton uh, scroll compressor can work and then the, this is the screw compressor and this is the range for the centrifugal compressor so up to 10,000 ton can be achieved with centrifugal compressor so what, what are the this is a seminar or a study by uh, CQIAC and um, um, and Schultz, uh, and they chose that uh, the low pressure R1234, R123 like alternatives, um, there are some that are inflammable and some that are flammable. So if you want DWP between 400 and 600, there are plenty. If you want DWP less than 150, they are mostly flammable. They are mostly better COP. You can see here um, the COP over the COP of R123. You can see most of them are higher COP, um, with few that are lower COP. Uh, they are near design compatible, which means that the capacity is almost um, the same. There is no drop, uh, significant drop in capacity. So this, you can see R123, this is R1, R514A. And you can see it's almost the same cap uh, capacity, almost the same COP. Um, and you can see here also, um, the isopentene is another potential alternative. Uh, actually, this is also important to notice. These two uh, refreshments, R1233 ZDE and uh, R1224 YDZ, these are um, uh, A2L refreshments or uh, slightly flammable refreshments. They have significantly higher capacity. You can see it's 40 to 60% higher capacity. And uh, the drop in COP is less than 1%, which means that if these, refre this, these refreshments are used, with um, slight uh, system optimization, we can achieve the same capacity, but high, equivalent or higher COP. Because when you move from this point to this point, you you, you increase you basically will have higher heat exchange area per uh, unit flow rate, and you would increase the COP accordingly. Now, if we work uh, with medium pressure R134 A like alternatives. Uh, there are low WP available today, like R1233 ZDE, 1224YD, 514A, 1234Z, and they are mostly non flammable. Um, they have good efficiency, no glide, and are compatible with existing designs. Now, with high, high pressure R14A alternatives, you can see that almost most of the alternatives have better COP. The capacity can be like either higher see here. And um, most of the um, equipment as, uh, or OEMs are working with R32 and R452B as alternative refreshments. Now, we can see that there are multi fragmentation. So with R134A, uh, if you are talking about refrigerators, hydrocarbon and R1234YF are, are the um, widely acceptable alternatives for mobile air conditioner. R1234YF and R152A are the widely acceptable. And for chiller and refrigeration, we have R, uh, R513A, R1234ZEE, and R1234YF as acceptable. So now we replace one refrigerant with a myriad of other refreshment. Also, R404A and R407C, these for transport refrigeration, uh, R452A and CO2 are acceptable for stationary 
R448A and R449A and B are acceptable as well as transcritical CO2 and cascaded cycles. For R14A like alternatives, it, it's a small charge, hydrocarbons and R32 for split units, R32 and R452B. And as you can see here, no single one in one to one conversion is happening. You are having different uh, solutions for different applications. So what are the related standards and codes? Um, so in the US, uh, there is ASHI standard 34 for safety classification. Internationally, there is ISO 8.7 safety classification. Uh, there is ASHI standard 15, provides application rules, large equipment, how can they be um, installed within a building? In the internationally, there is the SISO 5149 application rules. And there is the ASHI standard 15.2, um, and internationally there is the uh, EN 378. This is in Europe, the European Norm 378, a design guide for AC heat pump and equipment. Now, regarding the appliance or the equipment itself, uh, or the product itself, in the US, there are the UL or the underwriter laboratory equipment standard. So, for commercial refrigeration, room AC, domestic refrigerator, and so on and so forth. Internationally, there is the EN IEC um, series, so 6335 uh, 2 89 is for commercial refrigeration and freezing, uh, 2 40 is for AC and heat pump, 2 24 is for domestic refrigerators, um, and then more for other equipment as well. So in the interest of time, I just uh, skip this and uh, go directly to ASHRAE standard 34. How is it being um, described? Basically, if it's lower toxicity, it takes the letter A. If it's higher toxicity, the um, refreshing is uh, used with uh, the letter B. If the flame does not propagate, then it would take the, the, num the numeral one. If it, uh, it is of a lower flammability, it takes the numeral two, but if it's a mildly flammable or feeble, slow flame, then there is an L uh, associated with it. And then if it's a high flammability, it takes the numeral three. So an example of uh, an A2L refreshing would be R1234YF. An example of A1 refreshing would be um, uh, R14A or R134A. An example of uh, a B2L refrigerant would be ammonia. And you can see here the classification for the toxicity depends on the uh, occupational exposure limit or OEL. If the OEL is greater than 400 ppm, it takes the class A. If it's less than 400 ppm, it takes the class B. Uh, in the interest of time, I would also um, skip this. and um, focus here a little bit. So as it stand, as, as things stand right now, the IEC uh, standard 6335-2-24 for domestic refrigerator puts a charge limit of um, 150 grams for flammable refrigerants, mainly A3 refrigerants. For commercial refrigeration, uh, it's a little bit different, and we have um, Factors that impact the charge, like the minimum room size, the leak detection sensors, what kind of fan circulation. And for A2L, refreshing, the charge limit is roughly 1.2 kilograms. And for A3, uh, it's roughly half a kilogram. For uh, air conditioning and heat pump, um, there are a lot of factors impacting the allowable limit, mainly the minimum room size, the lower flammability limit of the refreshing, the lowest release height, so where are you installing your air conditioning in the room, the leak detection sensor available, and the ventilation. And you can see here that um, the charges are a little different. So we have A to L, uh, about 1.8 kilogram, A to 0.5 kilogram, A3, 0.15 kilogram, but it can be as high as 2.5 kilogram in special uh, circumstances with uh, limited measure. If we go with, with the additional uh, measures, um, we have um, for A2L, 8 kilogram, 
can go also to 70 kilograms for A2L, for A2 it's 3.4 and for A3 it's 0.3 kilograms. We talk about the ISO 5149 and the equivalent would be ASHRAE 15. We have uh, other limits as you can see here. So how can we use uh, the refrigerants safely? So we need to understand that if we have a fuel air mixture that is above the lower flammability limit and below the upper flammability limit, and we have an ignition energy or ignition source, we will have um, a, a, a detonation or a deflagra deflagration. But we need to understand what is the severity of the event. Is it severe or if, 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 if it is not severe? So this, the fuel-air mixture, we call it the combustible cloud. What is the volume within the room that has uh, air fuel or air refrigerant mixture between the LFL and the UFL? Then we need to recognize the ignition sources and restrict or enclose them as much as possible. So we want to select refrigerants that require the highest minimum ignition energy uh, to uh, deflagrate. And then we need to understand and study the severity of the event. So design application to handle pressure rise. For example, in the rooms, try to make sure that if there is a pressure rise, uh, there is a small window that would uh, burst outside and release the pressure. Also design refrigerant to minimize potential secondary issues. So, uh, for example, if we use hydrofluorolefins uh, or hydrofluorocarbons and they burn, they will uh, leave hydrofluoric acid, which is uh, very corrosive. And then there are, there are selected, select, uh, we need to select the refrigerants with the lowest possible burning velocity. We need to be aware of common hazards. So we want we don't want to smoke or allow others to smoke if flammable refreshments are being used, transferred, char charged, or recovered. We need to be alert for any potential ignition source like heaters, sparking motors, or switches, step electricity, and, and the like. When brazing or welding, we need to make sure that all refreshments has first been evacuated from the system. And um, not a new concern, but much more important. These are not new concerns, but uh, they are much more important with flammable refreshments. Now, I'd like to go through some systems perspective and present results, uh, experiment results. So these are experimental results done at Oak Ridge National Lab Laboratory. I, I did these uh, experiments in 2016 and 2017. Um, we uh, uh, that were designed for high ambient temperature and can operate up to 55 degrees C. So the performance and at the HRI condition or the uh, ISO T1 condition, we have 35 degrees C outdoor and 27 degrees indoor. You can see that for R22 alternatives, the only refrigerant that has higher COP is uh, is the propane. All the other refrigerants had COP between um, 82 and um, 90 percent that of R22, so significant loss in COP. In terms of capacity, we can see that all of the tested refrigerants had significantly lower capacity that are between uh, 2.5 to 15 percent lower capacity. At high ambient conditions, so when, when we go to 55 percent, we can see now that, again, the only refrigerant that has better performance is propane. Uh, but we can see that two alternative refrigerants are getting closer to uh, the baseline, so R44B and ARM20A. For R14A um, setup, so we, again, this is the equipment, uh, the outdoor unit, and this is uh, the indoor unit. The outdoor unit was uh, Measure, the performance was measured with a flow meter. The indoor unit was connected to a, a code tester. And you can see here the performance. So at uh, T1 conditions, R32 is higher COP, higher capacity. DR55 is higher COP, slightly lower capacity. And um, other refreshments are slightly lower COP. Uh, and um, uh, capacity decrease is between one to uh, about 15 percent. At high ambient temperatures, you can see that 
R32, DR55, HPR, all of these are high, uh, better COP, better capacity, and then all of the other ones are uh, better COP and slightly lower capacity. So looking at the packaged unit, so when we work with more of a central equipment, uh, we had an R20 unit uh, provided by SKM and an R14A unit divided by Petra. Uh, these are the units instrumented in the laboratory. You can see here we have the um, code tester in each of, connected to each of the indoor side. For R22, um, you can see here that the tested refrigerants, ARM28 provided higher COP, 5% better COP, but slightly lower capacity, and other refrigerants provided um, higher, higher capacity and um, lower COP between 3 and 7% lower COP. At higher ambient conditions, we can see that ARM28A is still higher COP, slightly higher COP, but significantly lower capacity, and the other refrigerants have roughly the same capacity, but the COP loss is between 5 to 15. 15%. For the R14A, all of the alternatives have higher COP, um, uh, but the capacity can be either higher, similar, or slightly lower. At high ambient temperatures, all of the alternatives have higher COP and higher capacity. For the uh, air phase two uh, uh, high ambient temperature, um, now, what they did is they compared a lot of refrigerants. So we have R32, ARM, uh, 71A, DR5A, DR55, HPR2A, L41-1, L41-2. And you can see here that um, there are plenty of alternatives to R14A that are better COP and better capacity. Most of these are R32 as well as DR5A and DR55. The other units um, are slightly higher COP, but the capacity can be compromised a little bit. At high ambient conditions, now you can see that most of the units, most of the tested units are better COP and better capacity, or better COP and slightly lower capacity. Um, in, in HRI, we found that um, discharge temperatures are higher, compared to R14A, so you can see here, R14A is the blue line, R32A in unit one is about uh, 15, 10 to 15 degrees higher uh, discharge temperatures. For unit two, they tested different refreshments, and you can see that the discharge temperature it is, it can be between two to about 15 degrees higher. Uh, in unit four, there was significant increase in R32 because it was not optimized, and so on and so forth. We have to be very careful. Now, um, in uh, in high ambient temperatures, uh, sorry, the refrigerant charge quantities, we can see that in most cases, the refrigerant charge are lower than that of R14A. So we improved um, the GWP uh, direct impact because we reduce the charge and we use lower GWP refrigerant. Finally, we need to consider the life cycle climate impact or life cycle climate performance when we study alternative refreshments. So you can see here, for example, uh, the R14A, R404A DX unit. So we are talking about uh, retail refrigeration system. You can see that the COP uh, uh, of the cooling of the cooling or refrigeration system um, has this kind of up, it doesn't go below four, go above four as the temperature drops, but as the temperature increases, the ambient temperature increases, the COP drops. You can see if, uh, if we use the booster system, the R744, uh, the COP is much lower at high, higher ambient temperature, but we can operate the R744 for much higher efficiencies at lower ambient conditions. That's why the R744 is much more efficient in. Um, um, in Europe and in Northern. So here we can see, like if you are in Buffalo, New York, like a, a cold climate versus Phoenix, Arizona, using R404A DX system, there is direct emission and there is indirect emission. Direct emission is 
emissions associated with the direct release of the refrigerant to the ambient. And there is the indirect emissions due to the energy consumption of the unit. You can see that when we moved from R404A to R448A, the direct emissions reduced significantly. The indirect emissions did not change much. When we moved to R448DX distributed, the direct emissions were further reduced. The energy consumption did not change. And then when we moved to the R744 booster system, the indirect emissions um, are almost the same as um, the direct plus indirect emissions of the R448D uh, distributed system. When we go to a, a hot climate now, you can see that um, uh, when we go to the, when we look at the booster system, the uh, carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide would have higher emissions compared to the DX system because efficiency for an, uh, would be lower for an extended period of time during the year. With that, I'd like to thank you for attendance and participation and interest in the, in the topic and uh, would like to open the floor for uh, any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Omar. We will now move on to the Q&A session. Uh, we're going to do our very best to answer all of your questions, uh, but if there are any questions that we weren't able to answer due to the time restriction, we're going to keep a record of all your questions, and then Dr. Omar, our speaker, will be answering them for you shortly, either by email or otherwise. So uh, our first question is from Wasim Mushtaq. And the question says, ammonia is a 3 to 10% more efficient refrigerant than CFCs, and ammonia consumes less energy in terms of kilowatts, and it has less damage to the ozone. Only ammonia is toxic. So why can't we use ammonia as a commercial refrigerant? Um, thanks, Wasim, for your question. I think you answered yourself. It's toxic. So uh, and it's not only toxic, it's toxic and slightly flammable. So ammonia is not used because um, primarily um, you don't have the easy way to control it in uh, commercial applications. And that's why it's widely used in industrial applications. So in industry, industrial refrigeration application, where you have good controls, good operation and maintenance schedule, you don't worry, you can put it and you save a lot of money during the operation. But in a commercial building where you have uh, less than optimal uh, technicians and operation staff, it would be very critical or very unsafe to use ammonia. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, our next question is from Lovewell Chitio, and the question says, if the HFCs and GWPs of 1000 plus, then why are we encouraging installation of these up to 2050? Um, Actually, we are, we are not encouraging. Um, if you have seen my earlier slides, I talked about the leapfrogging. We would like to rather move from HFC, HCFC directly to lower GWP alternatives. However, there are no alternatives that are widely available right now on the market, especially for high ambient temperature environments. So from that point of view, uh, we will need to use a transitional refrigerant, and these transitional refrigerants are mostly hydrofluorocarbons. All right. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Um, our next question is, why is the Kigali protocol getting poor response on ratification? Is it the new generation refrigerants' expensive costs? Um, why is the okay? So the the response, the ratification, um, the issue with the ratification is that you need to get consensus within your your country, and this is, sometimes countries can can get uh, responsive very quickly, and sometimes there are political changes within the country that would delay this process. A good example is is the USA. So um, if the if it wasn't for uh, Trump being elected. The USA would have ratified Kigali Amendment, but with uh, Trump in, in, uh, in control of the House uh, of the Senate, 
it's very difficult to ratify the Kigali Amendment. Um, for countries like in the Middle East and uh, developing countries, uh, it, it is in their best interest to ratify because if they ratify, they will get financial financial technical assistance. If they do not ratify, then they will be excluded and will not be able to uh, tap into the financial and technical assistance program provided by the Montreal Protocol. Thank you, Dr. Omer. Uh, the next question is from Romani Moawad, and the question is, what's the Montreal Protocol 2021? I don't understand the question. Can, uh, can he repeat what he mean, means by that? If you'd like me to read it again, I can read it. If you'd like it to be rephrased, then no, I, I can read it. I... Okay. Then I think he needs to rephrase the question. Okay. Please, um, Mr. Romani Moawad, can you please uh, rephrase your question? Because our speaker did not understand it. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Lovewell Chitio, and the question says, on slide 34, please kindly confirm that you were talking about compatibility with alternatives of the stated refrigerants. If so, it seems as if we have challenges with compressor compatibility so far. Um, I'm trying to get to the slide. Give me a second. Sure, take your time. Slide 34. Um, so, Mr. Lovell, is this the slide that you were talking about? Okay, so if this is the slide that, is, that he was talking about, this is just to show that for different compressive technology, these are the typical refreshment being used now. He's talking about this. Um, this slide, uh, the compatibility is mainly for uh, material compatibility, like for example, the oil seals, the elastomers, the valves, and, and all these things that are used within a vapor compression system. Um, let me try to read the question again, see if I can. Um, So on slide 34, the compatibility is strictly uh, referring to the pressure levels. So R134A like refrigerants, what are the refrigerants that would have the same operating pressure and the same boiling point? R14A like alternatives, again, the same thing, same uh, operating pressure and same boiling point. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Omar. I hope the question has been answered to Mr. Lovewell. Our next question, question Our next question is from Mr. Pedro. Uh, he says that he saw on slide 38, R32 and other refrigerants like substitute of R410 split air conditioning. There are several manufacturers in China and India that are using R290 and split equipments. I would like to know your opinion about the use R290 in this kind of equipment. Um, I am a, 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 a great proponent for using uh, uh, propane in small charge um, mini splits. Uh, propane is a very good, very efficient uh, refrigerant. Um, usually, for small equipment, you can operate with a charge less than 500 grams, which are okay for most uh, rooms up to 20 square meters. A challenge would be we cannot use. Uh, uh, floor mount units anymore. This would be, it would be preferable to use uh, um, high ceiling or ceiling mount or uh, uh, high wall mount units. The safety of the operation itself. Um, most designs are are fairly simple uh, to uh, to design with safe limits, safe right. um, measures basically. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, our next question is from Salman Sayed. Why are we not using natural refrigerants in commercial air conditioning units? Um, 
Um, so, uh, thanks, Salman. The, the main challenge is that for commercial air conditioning, we end up with uh, with large charge. So, if you are operating with a large charge, you won't be able to comply with the international codes and standards uh, associated with the safe charge limits. So, you can either design a chiller with uh, natural refrigerants and just into your building, that would be fine. You can design chillers operating with butane, isobutane, propane, um, uh, even um, ammonia if need be. If you can have a good uh, infrastructure, a good um, operation, service and operation team, but you won't be able to charge a packaged unit with a hydrocarbon because of the large charge contain required. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, the next question is from Esther Monroy, uh, and the question says, could you share any comments or info on LCCP analysis for R290 and R600A? Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I haven't done much uh, LCCP on these two refrigerants. I've done uh, LCP on, on others before, but in general, um, higher energy efficiency compared to the baseline and have significantly lower GWP, which means that from an LCCP point of view, um, these two refrigerants would, would have um, very good uh, performance. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. I hope the question has been answered. Our next question is from Ammar Bahman. Uh, the question says, where do you see the next refrigerant in the Middle East region, especially that we are facing extreme high temperature year after year while maintaining cooling capacity as well as COP? Um, okay, thanks, thanks Ammar for the question. This is a very uh, important one. In my opinion, we, uh, like in the Middle East or in high ambient temperature uh, environments, um, we should not worry uh, too much. Uh, like, basically, we, we should start to think about uh, uh, propane as a good alternative for small capacity systems. Um, it's a very simple, cheap, low cost, easy to use, high efficiency, high performance, very low GWP. For larger capacity units, uh, I think we should start using things like um, R32 and um, some of the lower flammability um, uh, alternatives like R452B and uh, and things like that. Uh, in terms of um, so the, like all these alternatives would have higher COP, so I think we will maintain and we'll be able to achieve even higher COP than what is available right now. He also asked about what is the glide of the refrigerant, and the glide of the refrigerant is the difference between the boiling point and the, and the viewpoint. So if it's a, the refrigerant is a single component refrigerant, um, then um, it will boil and, and condense at the same temperature. But if it's a multi-component refrigerant and the components do not have the same pressure, the, the refrigerant will, will boil or start to boil at, at a different temperature, then it would start to condense. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Next question, please. Yeah. yeah. The next question is, is there any eco-friendly gas developed against R22 for using with same machine? For using within the same machine? With the same machine, yes. Would you like me to repeat the question, or shall we ask Mr. Bijal yes. Kumar to repeat? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, there, there are plenty of alternative drop-in refrigerants for R22. One of the uh, most widely acceptable uh, drop-in alternatives for R22 is called R422D. Um, this has been tested significantly in uh, in the USA, and um, so acceptable performance you get slight drop in capacity and slight drop in, in cop 
consider to be a very good uh, alternatives because alternative because it is compatible for all with all the seals with all the pressure with all, with all the uh, valves and and so on. All right, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Unfortunately, we've gone a little over time, um, and so we have to conclude our session here. As I already mentioned, for everyone that asked the question and did not receive an answer, we have a record of your questions, and we'll be forwarding them to Dr. Ahmed. Um, thank you to everyone for attending our webinar. We hope you found it beneficial. And thank you so much, Dr. Omar, for sharing some of your valuable knowledge and expertise with us. To all the attendees, uh, we'd like to hear your feedback on today's webinar. As soon as I end this webinar, you will receive a pop-up of a survey. We are kindly requesting you to take this survey because your opinion is important to us. If you're unable to take it at this time, you will be receiving it later within a few hours on your email. So kindly take it from there. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you in our upcoming webinars. Bye.